The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to TechGeek webinar series, our endeavor to empower techies. We believe that sharing of knowledge is the key to enhance our skills and grow us as professionals. With this principle in mind, we have initiated a series of webinars conducted by industry experts to give you all a crisp insight of various domains. The topic of today's session is Cloud Enable Your Game, Storage and CDN. And our guest speaker today is Ujwal Kumar. He is the technical evangelist with Microsoft India. In the current role, he assists startups, partner organizations and enterprises with adoption of latest platforms and technologies. He focuses on games and app development targeting Windows Phone, Windows and Azure platforms. Prior to this, he worked as partner consultant and development platforms, worldwide specialization lead at Microsoft India. In the past, he has extensively worked on game development and image processing. He is the founder of very active community, India Gamers Community. He is also a reviewer of upcoming book, Learning Cocos 2D X Game Development for Pact Publishing, expected in later half of 2014. Additionally, he has authored 11 Think Week papers on various topics including gamification, AL, cloud computing, etc. and received comments from leaders like Bill Gates, Rico Malvar. So without further delay, I introduce you all to our guest speaker. Over to you Ujwal. Thanks Aradna and thanks to all the audience who have joined for the talk today. So, uh, as Aradna introduced, I work, my name is Ujwal, I work as a technical evangelist at Microsoft and today's talk is on cloud enabling your game with storage and content data network. And as we go along, I will go ahead and cover some of the core topics which is storage and how you can use the storage in, in con complete today's service industry. Second, I'll also talk about uh, Windows Azure content delivery network and how you can enable your games with the content net delivery network. We'll also talk about storage types and later part of the day uh, during this talk I will also focus a little bit about services like SQL database services which is available on the cloud. So when we look at the storage I wanted to bring to your notice a quick facts. Windows Azure Storage has uh, over 4 trillion objects which is processed with an average of over 270,000 requests per second and we also reach you know a peak of about 880,000 requests per second so we actually do a lot of churning of data on the cloud. This mere fact I wanted to bring to a notice because when you look at our games we actually work with a huge amount of data may not be in trillion but maybe you know million or sometimes it could reach out billion if it is a online multiplayer game. Now look at this scenario when you're building a game you would definitely need a very durable and scalable data source which could be used to provide data available all the time to your clients and customers. So when I talked about this uh, fact, I also wanted you know you to imagine about Windows Azure Storage, you know, and how it is built for a durable and scalable fact. So what we do is we in fact keep every file or object that you put in Azure in a replicated fashion almost three times within a region, and as a result, you get very high availability even if a rack or storage is down so we keep track of that as well so that's one of the key reasons of the replication part which I was talking about right and we also make sure that the availability of data is there with a service level agreement of data not going to be you know hampered or available 99.99 percent to you you can access the Azure database through or the storage through the RESTBase APIs and you can also do Azure services, the client services which is available which you can also go ahead and use it. So uh, you know I talked about the Azure application. I also want to talk about a piece of data storage called Azure Blob and this is something which is available to you from 
myself as well. So we'll talk about that in a in, in couple of minutes from now. But quickly wanted to bring to your notice about Geo Replication in this previous slide I talked about. So Geo Replication is a very unique feature which differentiates us from a lot of other providers. Uh, when you look about the uh, replication part, we actually make sure that we implement uh, multiple copies of data across different data centers which could be you know, multiple thousand miles apart. So uh, in terms of Azure storage, again I'll quickly get back to the point of what I'm going to talk about today. So a couple of things. Storage, we will talk about the key scenarios which we provide and key information which we use and how you can enable your game developers or if you're yourself a game developer, how you can use these scenarios into your game to build online multiplayer game with the Cloud Connect or offline and store the game data in the cloud whenever the customers sync to the cloud. So we'll talk about all of this in more details as we go along. A couple of things. As storage is highly scalable, durable, and available, as I mentioned. Blobs which we have can be exposed over HTTP uh, and through JSON you can also connect and install locally on the machine. And of course we have export import services. So I'll talk about all of this in much greater detail. Let's start with Azure Storage again. So as an IT developer uh, you know, or a uh, game developer, you need to know where the content is stored and how much compute time it will take or use. Right? And when you, you, in fact, you will also need to know what type of storage is available and what does, what it provides you. So I'm going to talk about all of this and also uh, about Windows Azure Storage which has a fault tolerance and we have content data network built in. So I'm going to talk about that in greater detail. So uh, some of these scenarios that I've just mentioned is uh, storage in the cloud, how you can use this storage app abstractions which is stable, blob, queue and drivers, uh, in fact drives, sorry. And then how an application can manage or can be managed by the controller, fabric controller which we have. And you know what are the options you have, for example, using a native storage or SQL Azure or in fact MySQL for that matter. And then we also have, or, or we will also discuss about the application state which is kept in the storage service so that the worker role can replicate as required. So we talked about the roles, the VM role and the worker role uh, in the last talk, if you have missed it. We have done two series in the past uh, wherein we talked about Azure mobile services and the last talk which we did was about the virtual machines and the compute. So in this talk, as we talked about, we'll you know go ahead and focus more on storage and content data network. So if you look at Azure storage, we we segregate into different layers. The first layer is front end or FE layer, which we call. Now this layer takes the incoming requests. We also authenticate and authorize the request, and then we route them to participant uh, partisan sorry, the partisan servers. So when I talk about this uh, front ends, you also, you know, uh, I should also bring to your notice that these partisan servers take things forward uh, for each request and it also serves as a front end server caches, you know, uh, with, with a partition map. So this partition map can be accessed, which is like a blob, table, or queues. These are actually the partition, so FE, which is marked in green, which you see in the slide is what I'm talking about right now. You can control this which uh, uh, through the uh, partisan and you can also access each of these parts in the server system. So all of this is available to you through a service, a database as a service which we will look upon a little later. The second one is partition layer. So talking about the partition layer which is there uh, in, the, in this slide as well. So when we look at this, this layer manages the partitioning of all the data objects in the system. So all the objects which has a partition key or you know an object which belongs to a single partition and each partition is served by one of these partitions of work can be used. When we look upon this in more detail, uh, it also provides automatic load balancing of different kind of partitions which come across the server and which requires traffic needs. For example, of blogs or tables or queues something like that. 
on, on in future. So, one more thing which uh, we do provide from the overall architecture perspective is distributed and replicated file system, so which is called DFS layer. And in this layer, we actually, uh, you know, this is a layer which actually stores and uh, the data and keep it durable. So, uh, you know, uh, one of the key concepts I want to bring to your notice is that uh, you and you must understand here is that the data is stored in uh, DFS, but all the DFS servers are uh, accessible from any of the partition server. So directly not use it, you use it to the partition server. So in this slide, uh, as I am sh uh, showcasing, uh, I am trying to bring forth the different layers and the front end layer uh, in this case particularly takes care of the incoming request and uh, give a front end server uh, you know some uh, specification which can talk to the partition servers in this case and it will need to uh, take the order to process the incoming requests. So the partition layer actually consists of all of the sub partition server with a ma master system to perform the automatic load balancing which is as I mentioned earlier and, uh, and also takes care of assignment of partitions. So as I have I've mentioned in this slide, you can see that each partition is assigned a set of objects like blobs, entities, queues and the partition master constantly monitors all of this uh, and you know do, does the overall load balancing on each partition server as well as the individual partitions. One more thing which we do is the lowest layer of the storage architecture in the DFS uh, which uses, uh, you know, is actually used to store and replicate the data can be accessed through the DFS server. Now, let's talk about the Azure account. So, uh, you know, we can, we can get the subscription, we can provision the Azure account uh, portal through portal management. We can go ahead and set the region and rules and we can also enable the content data network. So, I'll, I'll go back and talk about it in more detail. Uh, in fact, I'll go ahead and showcase this very quickly in a couple of minutes. But I also want to bring to a notice about storage security. So another quick question which comes to a lot of people uh, in games and any other app in general. So we have a very simple uh, and uh, shared, sec uh, you know, secret security kind of scenario wherein we uh, we can use HTTP and HTTPS to access. Uh, what we recommend is that you use HTTP for public content. Uh, and HTTPS for secure content uh, where you use it for shared access signatures. So, for example, if you have uh, a basic map in the game, right, if you, uh, if your game has map data or certain scenarios wherein you have some content which is specific to a user uh, after he has played certain level of the game, you will probably go ahead and uh, pass on the content to the secure channel. And for when when the game is enabled without logging in, and you have something to showcase uh, to everybody, uh, you know, uh, a person without logging in, you want them to play the game. Probably you'll have a public content with HTTP data. What we also enable is uh, two five one two bit keys. Uh, one key is used for signing the private request, and the two key support for holding of the keys. And we will talk. You know, if you have further questions, I'll talk more about it later in the Q and A kind of time. Uh, from security perspective, I also want to talk about the fault domains and server failures. So, in the last talk, I actually gave a brief description about it. So, I just wanted to do a brief touch upon uh, on this topic again, uh, so that we are aware of the uh, the scenarios of failures and how we handle them. So, the first concept which we provide uh, is that the data is spread out across the server uh, through different uh, fault domains and if a hardware fault occurs or whenever it occurs, only a small percentage of servers are affected, right? And the servers for these three layers are broken up over different fault domains. So, uh, we have a rack, network, switch, power, etc. Right, all these uh, whenever one by one goes down, the other services are still available for serving the data. So I'll quickly talk about the front end 
partition and uh, DFS as you can see in the slide. So uh, if a front-end server becomes unresponsive, then the load balancer will realize this and uh, we take take it out of the available server and, and this, that serves the request from incoming uh, source and uh, this ensures that the requests hitting the source get sent to a live front-end server that are waiting to uh, process the request. So, you know, we do uh, handle that um, kind of scenarios. Then other other one which I want, we, I want to bring to your notice which we do serve is partition server failure. So in this case, if the storage system determines that a partition server is unavailable, uh, we immediately reassign any of these partition and uh, that whatever we are serving to another available partition server and the partition map for that front-end server is updated to reflect, uh, replicate or in fact to reflect the data on the change so that the front-ends can correctly locate and re reassign the partition. So what happens in this case is that when assigning partitions to a different partition server, uh, no data is moved around the disk since it's just the virtual uh, scenario which we handle right uh, in this case. So since all the partition data is stored in the DFS layer and accessible from partition server. So in this case the time is not lagged. There's no, there's no issue with the time lagging. Actually we just take care of the uh, layer which is above the actual storage of the data. And this ensures that you know, all partitions are served well as well. So in terms of, of DFS server failure, now this is a typical scenario wherein if a storage system determines that the DFS server is unavailable, the participant uh, partition layer which is available on top of it stops responding, right? And uh, the partition layer stops using the DFS server which is uh, on top of it for reading and writing while it is unavailable. In this case, what it does is uh, partition layer use the other available DFS server as I mentioned earlier that we have replications done. So it just takes care of, uh, of that through changing the data or the uh, uh, layer, the DFS layer to other one which is available. And if a DFS is unavailable for that very long, then what we do is we generate additional replicas of the data in order to keep the data at a healthy number of replication for durability. So we actually take care of that quickly. Now in terms of uh, abstractions which is available to you for usage and I'll also go ahead and talk about where or what should be used at, at what point of time. So blobs are the first one, you know, uh, we provide multiple scenarios so for example to store uh, binary or text images or messages or structured data in Azure. So blob service is mainly for storing binary and text data, right? And when you talk about binary and text data, it possibly could be large set of images uh, which you want to have or use in the game or maybe textures which you want to use in the game. Even for that matter, if you have some kind of uh, a small video or, or, or audio, if you want to use it, you can also use it possibly in your game using the blob. Queues are mainly meant for storing messages that could be accessed by the client. So you, you possibly can use queues there. Uh, the table service which we have is mainly for structured storage for non-relational data. For relational data type, we have other services like MySQL or SQL Server, which I'll, I'll bring forth to you in a few minutes from now. Otherwise, uh, we also provide Windows Azure Drives, which is used for mounting the NTFS uh, volume and it is accessible to code running in your Azure service. So we also provide that to you. So programmatic access to blob, queue, and table is available uh, via Microsoft Azure Managed Library and also through uh, the Azure Storage REST-based services if you are using it. So quickly want to talk about the concepts here. As a best practice, you should choose the same location for your storage account and your host service. And uh, you, know, you should also allow the computation, uh, in fact, in this scenario when you're using the same scenario, a same hosted service, this will allow the computation to have a very high bandwidth and low latency storage and the bandwidth, whenever the bandwidth is free for computation storage is used in the same location. Uh, one quick thing to bring to your notice here is that a storage account can hold up to 100 TB of data in it which is a huge amount of data. There is 
no other storage capacity uh, limit for a storage account. So in, in particular, you know, if, if you look at it or if you ask me, there is no limit on the number of blob containers or number of blobs or tables, entities, queues or messages that can be stored in the account. Other than they must all add up to under 100 TB. Right? That's the overall limit. Uh, I'm going to quickly talk about uh, some of these in more details and then I will go ahead and jump to uh, the demo where we will create some kind of data and service and try to access it uh, or maybe just create there and then we, you can go ahead and try and access it from your services. So when you talk about blob storage, now blob storage is the simplest way to store data, right? Uh, we contain binary and then it can be as large as up to size of 1 TB. Also, uh, you know, I, as I mentioned in the slide, blobs are, uh, you know, right for some situation but not, uh, you know, structured scenarios. For structured scenarios, you would possibly like to use tables or, right? But, but blobs, you know, as large object or images, as I mentioned earlier, you should go ahead and use it. So uh, what goes into the blob storage? Like this could be a possible question you, know, you might ask, right? So in that scenario, I'll quickly go ahead and talk about it. Uh, so if you ask me what, what goes in the blob storage, the blob service, you know, provides a storage for entities like binary files, as I mentioned, text file. The REST-based API for the blob service exposes two kind of resources. One is container and one is blob. Right. The container is a set of blobs, and every blob much, uh, you know, uh, should or must belong to a container. Blob, for that matter, stands for binary large objects. So the blob service contains of two types of blobs. Again, block blobs, which are optimized for streaming, and page blobs, which are optimized for re reading ran uh, or writing random files, you know, and which are which could provide the ability to write for a range of bytes in the blob. So again, as I mentioned, you can possibly have videos uh, or images or any kind of large file system for your game stored here in the blob. Uh, one thing about block blobs I wanted to mention here is that block blobs larger than 64 MB must be uploaded in a set of blobs and each of which must be less than 4 MB in size. Now I, I believe like for example if you have images, uh, you know, this is one of the diagrams which I mentioned. So, uh, you can have one account type, you have multiple containers, then each container, uh, each blob will be, will be under a container, right? And then you can have page blocks or blobs. I'll talk about blob containers in more detail in uh, next. So let me just go ahead and uh, talk about it. So this is just a gra uh, visual rep representation. Now let me talk about blob container. So what exactly is blob container? So when, when a storage account can contain unlimited number of containers, right? Uh, so root container use, uh, are always useful when serving, uh, you know, s some kind of silver light or flash out kind of blob storage. And you may need to uh, store cross domain kind of uh, access file policy in, in this root of domain. We do provide some kind of uh, metadata which is up to 8 KB of key name value pair per container as well for you. So a special kind of root container. Uh, we, when you talk about root container, so a root container usually you can use for serving a default container for the storage account and uh, the storage account may have one root container. The root container can explicitly be created in under the root name as I mentioned here. So this is mainly to, as, as we go back alone, again the container could be multiple set of images or you know a, a video for video processing and so on and so forth. Uh, now let me switch to tables, structured data. So in your game for that matter we talked about leaderboards in the first talk. Leaderboard where we used table, I'm going to showcase that uh, same thing in more details. For example we have account, table and then entity. So, uh, a table is a set of group of entities and an entity is a name a value pair and uh, when we looked at the key value or name value pair, so we partition it by key wherein uh, we scale out the number of binaries of ent entities and we partition to the support uh, 
uh, in fact, to support load balancing. One important thing to note here is that tables are not and should not be used to support relational database. Relational databases are meant for a different purpose and we have SQL and MySQL support on MySQL and MySQL support on the cloud for both of this. Now coming to uh, queue storage, so uh, queues are used to send messages between the services. So for example, you will see that when we are monitoring uh, your storage account in the management portal, you will see that the queue service provides a reliable uh, persistent messaging within uh, two different services. And uh, these are like based out of REST based APIs and we expose them through our queue service, uh, we expose queues and messages. So each storage account may have an unlimited number of messages and queues that are named uniquely within the account, so it has to be uniquely named and each of these messages queue may contain unlimited number of messages. So maximum size for a message is limited to 8 KB though. Right, so so we have account and then queue and messages separately. In this slide, I want to talk about you know as an IT pro or a developer, you you will want to know why you know, other developers or developers use this type of storage and how it impacts the role you have you know uh, uh, in terms of deploying the service you are managing. So you you need to work on or know about the queue which allows the apparent performance of an application to be improved. This can be taken care of through the roles which you have defined. Uh, the work can be buffered in queues and performed later as, as shown in the diagram. And we also allow simple async communication between the roles like web role and worker role which you can see here. So this is why we have you know, a loosely coupled workflow in queues which is available and provided to you. Now I want to talk about drives. Uh, now, in games, mostly you will be restricting yourself to uh, Azure blobs, tables, and queues, or probably you will you might also want to stick yourself to uh, maybe SQL or if you want to go with relational problem, SQL or MySQL. Drives, for that matter, are generally used for VHDs if you are going to use right. And uh, what we do provide with the drives are, for example, we have durable. NTFS volume for Windows Azure instances and we use this for existing NTFS API to access network attached through a durable drive. What we use is system.io from net. The benefit is that when you're moving existing application from NTFS to, uh, you know, it's very, very easy to move it to the cloud. Second benefit is that the durability and survival of the application uh, uh, or the data is instantly done and uh, recycled. Right. The part of Windows Azure Drive is uh, NTFS BHD page blob. Now this allows to mount over the network as an NTFS drive. You know, and also you can copy cache data. You can do uh, all kind of stuff like flushing or um, unbuffered writes to the drive and make these durable to the page blob. This is one scenario where probably if you are setting up the whole virtual machine and trying to play with it, probably you can go and use that. The scenario, uh, you know, quickly to talk about is, let's say uh, Azure Drive, you are using as a page blob as formatted as a NTFS single VHD uh, virtual hard drive. Then drive can be up to one TB, and then you can store data over there, where where in on one instance at a read time, uh, read write kind of scenario, you can use it. You can also use it for the snapshots of multiple instances at once. So pretty much this is something which you might not or will not be using for game, but since it's available, I wanted to bring to your notice here quickly. And uh, a basic diagram in terms of how it works, I'll jump to that. Uh, so we have, uh, you know, a data mounting and caching kind of scenario wherein uh, Azure Drive acts as a local drive mounted to the file system and is accessible to code while running in, in the role, right? Uh, so wherein this is where we write the data. The data is written to Microsoft Azure Drive and is stored for page blob, which is defined within Microsoft Azure Blob Service. 
and cached to the local file system. The other thing is uh, because the data is written to the drive, is stored to a page drop, the data is durable. So it can be used across, right? So that's the concept here in terms of using the blob and uh, the Azure page blob and the page Azure drive. Uh, quickly want to talk about the failover kind of thing. So, uh, you know, we, uh, we have options to read, write, drives and maintain a lease. In case of failure, we need to wait for a lease to expire, which is less than a minute before remounting, which is also available to you. I'm going to skip this part, which is something wherein we're not going to use in the game scenario. So I'm going to go ahead and talk quickly about the content data network. But before I do that, let me just mention about the fundamental abstraction one more time. To summarize, we have blobs, drives, tables, and queues, and we can use the storage client library easily to access these scenarios and also rest based the API as a service to access these scenarios. Also uh, in terms of blobs, we should uh, binary objects we should be using. For example, images, uh, videos, text, and then uh, tables for structured storage, not for relational queues for queues and uh, uh, text and messages and queues, right? Now let's move on to content delivery networks and CDN, and this is something which I want to talk about quickly because you know most important thing, speed matters, right? Whenever you're building a game or an app, uh, for that matter, if it's a bank scenario or in traffic, or you, uh, you know, uh, you're on a date properly. Nobody wants to wait, and this is something which is very, very true, even for online gamers or you know, game players or any info. Right? A website loads, or a, a people, people, you know, especially in case of game, right? Nobody wants to wait for the data to come in and then make the next move. So uh, response time is very important and it plays a major uh, role or in makes a ma major impact on the user experience. So, uh, you know, uh, there's a lot of stats around it for, for that matter. Uh, you know, some of the web species sites have found the impact to be very, very significant. So, for example, Google found that, you know, a 500 millisecond slows down equal to 20% decrease in ad revenue. Uh, you know, uh, for that matter, Microsoft being found that you know, a two second slowdown means 2.5 decrease in the queries and overall clicks. Uh, Amazon has another interesting data which is like 100 millisecond slowdown or, or which is one tenth of a second can mean a one percent decrease in the revenue which is huge. So, uh, I mean, apart from the dissatisfaction you will get from the customer or end user who's playing your game, uh, you know, which has data storage on anywhere else, right? Uh, so. Content delivery networks helps a lot and offers a lot of services. I'm going to talk about that in more detail. So content delivery network offers the infrastructure as a service to uh, companies from efficient delivery of content to users across the world, right? Uh, we uh, can enable delivery of video, audio, uh, you know, some kind of images or other files from server closest to uh, end users very, very quickly. Especially in case of games when we're looking at, we have all kind of scenarios wherein we would need such kind of services. So the use of content data network has a obvious economic advantage, you know, in terms of uh, enterprises, uh, or also in terms of improving the experience, right, uh, over the web. So I'm going to quickly go ahead and talk about how does CDN work quickly, you know, and then uh, how Azure uses CDN. So, uh, you know, if you look at this slide, uh, in a CDN or content data network, the content exists in multiple copies on a strategically dispersed servers, right? And uh, we also call this as a content replication. When we look upon this, uh, a large content data network has, you know, uh, in fact, they can have thousands of servers, making it possible to provide identical kind of content to many users efficiently and reliably, you know, even at the time of maximum internet traffic and uh, during, you know, uh, certain kind of demand spikes, it enables it to provide such kind of scenarios and tech tackle such kind of scenarios. So uh, when we look at a specific page, file or program, you know, uh, and look at these kind of requests, uh, CDN actually optimizes the speed at which the content is delivered to that end user, right? Uh, 
some of the scenarios like for example you know maybe let me just look at the previous slide content distribution path so uh, you know legacy content data networks require hundreds and even thousands of low capacity uh, you know pops across the globe and some of the scenarios are still used however with Microsoft Azure content network we have a different new look right in terms of building a smaller number of very powerful uh, hubs at worldwide uh, locations and then you know we are strategically using both network and geographical terms uh, in terms of handling content data network so let me uh, switch to the next slide and talk about uh, the types of content. So a typical uh, you know, website, if you have, generally you know, contains of a mix of static and dynamic content. And for that matter, it also uh, you know, is same, or it, it will apply to game scenarios as well. Where you have a game uh, mostly with, with a static. Some of the information will be static, most of them will be dynamic as per the gameplay. Now most of which uh, you know, affect the load times, of course. Uh, and when we look at uh, also the user from a tolerance perspective for slow, uh, slower in, uh, information coming in or sl uh, sluggishness in the game or choppy streaming which is fading fast so those kind of scenarios can affect the customer. Uh, from the static cons uh, content perspective we, uh, it could be fixed objects right for example your uh, help content for that matter or maps in the game uh, or the images, you know, or some kind of media, and and then for the dynamic content, it could be possibly your uh, you know personalized leaderboard kind of scenario, personalized information which you provide as as the game goes along. Now, if you look at the key requirements, you know, the first thing which we definitely look upon is the performance and reliability, which is uh, a fast content delivery to a con continuous availability. Right, and the second thing, which is solution already applications and services for for your game that are designed to meet the need of the business model or your use case scenarios in in your games, right? And the third thing is uh, the implementation or maintenance and support kind of scenario. So uh, to make a short, you know, a story long, if you ask me, uh, a simplified procurement kind of scenario. Yeah, we provide a high quality holistic support. Uh, you know, and ease of deployment and integration with your IT infrastructure through content delivery networks. So I'm quickly jumping to uh, Microsoft Content Delivery Network solution, right? So uh, when you look at the Microsoft Content Delivery Network, we com combine the speed and reliability to create uh, a stable uh, business requirement solution, right? In this in this diagram, we are just talking about some of the good benefits which you have. For example, the I talked about the basic features and I talked about uh, the advanced features and the cloud services we talked about in the last deck. So uh, let me just uh, jump to and talk about a little bit more. So Microsoft Azure Content Delivery Network is built uh, with an architecture that is designed for current web or today's web, right, uh, or web-based solution for that matter, which or where we have a rich media which applies in the game scenario and also we need uh, access or consumption by users or millions of users you know for that matter so uh, IP based load balancing is required massive storage computing is required so all these scenarios we take care of through this now Microsoft Azure CDN you know uh, we, we can quickly deploy a solution optimized to meet you the specific needs of game developer for that matter if whether it is basic media or you know you have mobile services or all on, on anything like that so for that matter if you look at a cloud-based uh, media solution right for many of the existing technology like ingest encoding format conversion content production or you know uh, in fact on demand or live streaming kind of scenario if you want to have in the game all of this is possible like uh, we also provide scalable cloud backend for building uh, games or targeting store uh, windows phone apple you know ios and uh, android kind of scenarios or even javascript kind of applications or games so we are uh, you know backed with different scenarios with different locations across the globe so we you can find that we have CDS across North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia, and we have multiple locations included in this. A lot of infrastructure uh, available to this, and we have 
a you know large scale enterprise grade kind of solution which is available uh, for for users to integrate. In fact, in the games, when you integrate Skype and all kind of services, you know, we, we, we can also do that. For that matter, in Skype, we are using the same kind of scenarios. Uh, we can definitely optimize, you know, as per the requirement, so you can optimize as per your need. As we talked about uh, media solutions, we talked about web applications, mobile services, all of this is possible. Uh, let me talk about the uh, initial features and the roadmap features, some of them. So uh, if you look at the initial features which we have already, you can access content, uh, uh, Azure storage kind of scenario of which talk about blobs, table queues kind of thing. And uh, you can also access cache content over uh, HTTPS or a shared SSL certificate. So uh, very much available query strings uh, you can also use for different, uh, to differentiate the object retrieved from origin or you can use HTTP request that contains a query string that can be cast differently across to your needs, right? And you can also, uh, you will have the ability to use custom domain names as well, right? So there are so many scenarios which can be used across for the content retrieval network. I'll move further to talk more about the features which are available, right? So Microsoft Azure uh, CDN is integrated into Azure portal, and we'll talk about that. I'll show you some, some of these scenarios in a couple of minutes from now now. So uh, we also enable to easily configure and uh, control Azure services and applications or games that matter. So the CDN um, you know, feature with the Azure portal will include the ability to publish your content from Azure storage account. Uh, you can use the query string to differentiate your object retrieve from origin. You can use the or access cached content over HTTPS and uh, using the shared SSL certificate. And you can assign or use a custom domain name, which is available. Media services are also available for you to uh, you know, uh, integrate with your games and console games for that matter, uh, you know, specifically or you know, video on demand or mobile or uh, tablet or Windows Store games for that matter. So it's very much possible to integrate. A quick slide on differentiation and you know what makes it uh, better than some of the competition which is available. So you know we have a very good uh, offer on easy to understand you know uh, and we also provide a pay only uh, what you use kind of system which is also available with multiple competition uh, uh, which allows you to manage your budget under one umbrella right down you know to the subscription level. You can have uh, a support which is available uh, from the, the support team. And then we have also a management ease wherein you can use everything under one workflow through your subscription uh, through the manager's portal. Right, I'm going to skip this slide, uh, these two slides for uh, and jump to a scenario wherein how you can get started with your Azure quickly so you you uh, and CDN so for that matter so you can have uh, reliable performance and then so you can you can get started with the managed Azure slide uh, let me just go ahead and open that to you and then we'll come back to SQL store database so I'm going to switch to my desktop mode now and here you can see that I have uh, Azure storage uh, scenario which I'm going to quickly raise. So this is my managed portal, right? And you can see that I have SQL database and I have Azure, right? Then I talk about media service which is also available to you to use, right? And then we have a couple of other stuff which is quickly, you know, I talk, didn't talk about store simple which is also a new feature which has been added which can incorporate with your storage. Now, uh, let me quickly go one by one. In fact, CDN is also available. I just talked about it. So, you know, for that matter, you want to add, create a, C a CDN endpoint, you just go ahead and get started from here. So you say, you know, I want to add app service CDN and then you can add the origin domain and then get started. So very simple from there. But let's go one by one. So I'm going to go ahead and go back to storage first. We'll jump to SQL database a little later. So say create storage and then data storage and then quick create. So you'll probably provide the name of 
the storage type let's say test game one look for the name uh, it's available then you choose the location again as we suggested use the local location which is close by or or then make it your redundant or locally redundant you can do that or read access your redundant so it's very much possible to choose a replication type and then say store account created so then we have storage being created and then you can go ahead and possibly use all this, uh, the three types you know which is blob queues and tables from there in the same fashion you can have a sql database type which you can you know create a new one or manage uh, old one so for that matter if i say create a new one sql data services that so in data services we have multiple other services like uh, uh, recovery services also part of it hd insight is also there right uh, for a hadoop scenario storage as i talked about blobs tables and queues database is mainly for relational i'm going to talk about database a little more so let's say when i say quick create uh, or let's say use custom create for that matter. So when you look at custom create, we have two options. You know, using which subscription you're going to use it. So for that matter, let's say I'm going to use it for uh, another. Let's say test game one. So database settings, and then say, uh, you know, I'm going to use it for web kind of scenario. You have multiple options to set based on your subscription type right and then uh, choose a server so which server where exactly you want to have so probably I'll possibly go with East Asia which is close to where I am and then go ahead and create the database in the meantime I already have the storage so I'll jump to in here and then you can see that we have managed access keys so when you want to include in your web services and want to use in your code you'll possibly use through your managed access key and here you can copy this and you know the primary access and the secondary access and probably go ahead and use it in your game or app. Uh, SQL data storage I think it's also created so this one again you can go ahead and export or you can manage right so for that matter let's say when I click on manage let's see what happens to it so current IP address is not included I, I will say yes included this is something wherein you would like to uh, add yourself so that the firewall service is being added say yes because uh, the access to management portal is restricted, not everybody can access it. Uh, you know, you need to probably add. Uh, you know, there's additional layer of firewall security which is added so that uh, not everybody can access your cloud uh, information or data, right, directly. So that's one. Right. So we have the SQL Server database. Then you need to add a username and a password. So let's say add admin kind of user simple one and then say add a password right and say login so error and connect to server but anyway so this is something wherein how you can go ahead and connect your server and then go ahead and manage the account so we'll uh, leave this for now and go back now I'll jump I'll come back to this a little later maybe look at the dashboard and see how goes on so we have we look at deadlocks uh, you can look upon the failed connection successful connection and so on and so forth you can monitor uh, all of this uh, you know as we go along I have nothing in this database so you don't see anything as such right now there's no deadlocks or no failed connection but and then we want to scale it up so let's say you want to scale it up to uh, next level uh, we can we can easily scale uh, the maximum size to 5 GB for that matter, I've created a 1 GB kind of scenario. And we can configure the data. So for example, I want to configure, uh, you know, I want to create uh, from ex by exporting. So I can say create a new database. So I can create from the same server a new database and, and work on. So let's move further. I'm going to go ahead and talk more about the Azure uh, SQL database and what it provides. So this is something wherein you would need a relational kind of service then we'll go ahead and use it and uh, I could want to talk about how is it different from VMs so uh, it's typically different from multiple types as we go along so it's you know something wherein you have resources, total cost of optimization benefits and if you look at features you know so SQL Server in a VM is a little different than uh, Azure SQL database service what I showed now was uh, Azure SQL database it uh, practical uh, last 
talk, we talk about the VMs where you can actually go ahead and create a virtual machine uh, and have a SQL uh, running inside that. So, uh, uh, you know, one of the important scenarios that uh, we have a built-in programmatic database admin type structure which you can use directly from the, the scenario, from Azure service. Now, uh, SQL Azure service, right? So, I want to talk about, uh, you know, some quick scenarios, for example, the uh, tiers which are available, so there are different uh, access levels, as you saw, like I had a premium account, you possibly will have uh, three different uh, service tiers, for example, basic, standard and premium. And depending on the transaction workloads, you will choose either of these, right, and, uh, and then go along. So, when we uh, look upon the Azure SQL database new data service like based on customer feedback we have uh, you know introduced these services to help uh, people like yourself uh, to use more you know uh, and innovate more on the cloud design pattern so again depending on what your usage is and how you're going to use in you know long term you have some kind of uh, a database size defined and the price points which are available per month kind of scenario Right. Remember last time I showed the Azure calculator scenario. So calculator is the right place to look at and you know determine if you really need a SQL database service which is relational or your work can be done with Azure Storage. For in my experience with uh, the India gaming community and, uh, and the game developers in India, we have found that most of the work which is uh, you know required for storing uh, media content or maps or uh, information can be tackled easily with the storage or uh, tables, blobs and queues, you need not go with relational, which is relational database are on a higher side of cost. So uh, some of the metrics for that matter, you know, you have management portal API as I talked about, you have depth view, uh, you know, management views and, and so on and so forth. Uh, in terms of uh, services, you know, we have a lot of recovery map model. We also provide geolocation and geo-replication kind of scenario which is available to you. Uh, as I talked about, I showed uh, the active geo-replication in, in, in the last slide. Now, there's another interesting thing which you can do is actually migrate from an existing on-premise SQL uh, you know, uh, data and server apps to your Microsoft Azure virtual machine. And this is very easily done through uh, you know multiple ways one way is like you can migrate the hyper uh, v vht of uh, and you can actually mag migrate the entire vht to the azure virtual machine for that matter you can do that for development testing in the cloud you know we also provide a lot of good scenarios uh, and you know you have an opportunity to not only reduce the cost through this but also speed up the time to market as uh, you know the instance is available on Azure machine which can be provisioned in few minutes right and and you know you can use it in weeks on premises depending on resource availability and whenever you want to use it you can probably procure and use it so uh, with the team foundation server also available on Microsoft Azure you can you know consistently work on the application or game development life cycle uh, through the management policy so it's it's very very easy and fast and ready to use in hours not in weeks right and of course you can back up to the cloud as and when required so you know see you some of the scenarios I want to talk about now uh, I quickly want to dump into some of the uh, app related or game related scenarios for that matter uh, you know when you want to build a new cloud designed apps in this case I'm talking about games you know you can actually reach out to uh, all of these uh, devices I have mentioned here right Mac Windows Store Android Windows Phone all kind of scenarios and uh, this is one of the information from 3M they mentioned that you know because management time cost is so low with Azure you know we focus on going a business not on managing the day right and and there are a lot of good scenarios, software as a service kind of scenarios. So, some of the, the customer scenarios I mentioned and bring forth to you. Now, in this case, I really want to, to reiterate and, you know, before we close, uh, SQL database service is a relational uh, database service which is fully managed by Microsoft 
and if you want to use something which quickly can be stored and accessed by service through NetBase APIs or through mobile services, you can go ahead and use the storage which is uh, of type blob, tables and queues and very, very accessible and quickly achieve, uh, you know, achieve. So go ahead and use that. The other options I talked about is uh, from infrastructure side, IS side, we have Azure virtual machines which could be used, uh, you know, where you can use the VMs to directly store and update. Uh, we also offer this platform as a service, uh, especially uh, for technologies in the games, for example, Azure SQL database you just saw, or, uh, you know, the other services, for example, the storage scenario. And the trade-off between PS model is, you know, the control. You you give up some breadth of capabilities and customization in exchange for ease of management. That's the scenario where we, where we have advantage with. Now, with this, I'd like to thank you. You know, we are done with, with the talk for today. I'll take a couple of minutes to uh, ask, you know, if somebody has questions, please feel free to ask. And, uh, you know, uh, you, you try this time, and then the content will be available uh, through TechGeek site wherein you can go ahead and refer to it later if you want to or ask for the questions. So thanks, Aradna. I'll, you know, I'll hand it over to you. Uh, you know, please uh, let me know if you have questions. Up there. Thanks for the insightful presentation, Ajwal. Uh, as you have just mentioned, let's quickly take up the questions now. I would have to request you to read out the questions and their answers so that all our users may listen to your insight. And as we have only a few minutes left, I uh, request you to take a few of the questions and then you can sum up the session for today. All right, I will do that. So let's get started. Like if uh, as as the questions are coming in, I'll go ahead and take those questions, right? And Are you able to see the questions coming into you. Right. So uh, I see. Yes. So, which enterprise level technology uh, being used for fault domains and server failures, right? So, uh, we have, uh, so in Microsoft uh, platform, we do provide the Azure uh, drives for that matter. So, uh, fault domain, we have, we have handled two things. For example, we have uh, Azure drive. In that drive, we talked about the uh, instances and we talked about the uh, fault enablement options, right? So let me just go back to uh, the slide deck quickly and probably answer that with, with that to be useful and helpful. Right, so I talked about the front end layer and I talked about partition layer and talked about distributed uh, replication file system, DFS layer, right? So uh, when you look at this uh, technology, uh, the fault domain uh, and server failures are handled in all these three layers. Partition layer, uh, you know, typically start with the front end layer, which is a virtual layer, like which handles, you know, can be accessed through blob tables and queues. Then we talked about the partition layer, which is basically, again, taking care of a virtual layer, which is where the data is actually not stored. The data is actually stored in the DFS uh, layer, which is, has the replicated file system enablement. And all these three, the first two layers just changes based on the issue which is being formed. And the last layer is used for replicating the data. Uh, there is another question uh, which is around which enterprise, no, no, this is not the same question. Let me just go back to the next question. Which enterprise techno level technology being used of the same question? Are you guys going to discuss open source technology as well with Windows Azure? I am working on Java domain, and so it's feasible for me to work on Windows. Uh, is it feasible for me to work on Azure platform? Yes, Java is very much supported, and in fact, open source technology is also very much supported. In fact, all open source technology is supported, most of them. Uh, quickly, I am going to go ahead and jump back to uh, my uh, Windows uh, view here, and if you look at the open source of view, in fact, for that matter, let me just go ahead and go back to the virtual machine which I talked about last time and we say create new option, right? And go back to the virtual machine and look from gallery for that matter. So uh, you can choose uh, image. So here we have Microsoft related uh, things, but we also have Java for that matter. You can see JDK available, right? 
uh, we have, uh, of course, Dynamics and Oracle and all that stuff is there. Then you have SUSE Linux for that matter, Ubuntu. So all of this, you know, for the VM perspective, Open Logic Linux, all of this is these are available to you. So you can use this as a infra infrastructure service IaaS. You can also use them uh, from the platform as a service through uh, the cloud service platform. So both are available to you. Yep. Uh, other than that, from the uh, database service side, we also provide support to uh, MySQL, right? And uh, uh, which is now from Oracle, and we do support that as well. So you can go ahead and use that, you know, for that matter. So I don't see many questions coming in, Aradna. Uh, if so yes, due to time uh, constraint, I have to request you to uh, you know sum up the session for now. Uh, there are questions coming in, but uh, let's take them offline, if that is all right, right. with you. Right. Yep. Yep. Sure. You can take. All right. Questions if you would like, you can sum up the session now. Great. So uh, in terms of what we talked about, we discussed three things in the last three talks. First thing was about Windows Azure mobile service wherein we talked about uh, identification as well in terms of how you can create login services using Facebook, Twitter, or Google for that matter, or Microsoft account. So how you can go ahead and create a uh, login for your game. And then I talked about leaderboard, how you can store information through mobile services in the first. And the second talk was in, uh, about the cloud services and how you can use virtual machines or worker role or VM role to have uh, compute done on the cloud specifically. And in today's talk, we discuss about different options for storage. Uh, we talked about the blobs, queues, and tables, and where you can use what. The, then we also talked about SQL service, which is pro available on Microsoft Cloud. And we also discussed about content data network. So these are some of the scenarios typically which you are going to use in the game. And uh, you know, as we go along, if you have any further questions, feel free to reach out to TechGig and I'll be you know, uh, added to that and I'll go ahead and respond from there. Thank you. And I'm really thankful to our guest speaker today for conducting this wonderful webinar. It was indeed a great session. I would also like to thank all our participants for their support in making this webinar a success. The recording of the webinar will be available on TechGig.com by tomorrow. Thank you all for joining us today. Thank you, Ujwal, for taking the time out. I hope you have a great evening ahead. Yep. yep. Thanks, Rana, and thanks all the attendees. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye.